Uh, we are uh, pleased and shocked to see a room full on the last day. It shows uh, how much engagement there is in this audience uh, for the election. My name is Ron Brownstein. Okay. I am the editorial director of the National Journal Group and the political director of Atlantic Media, your co-hosts here with the, uh, the Aspen Institute. And we are here on this final day to offer you uh, who have not yet had enough analysis of the campaign. Something a little different, we hope. Uh, what we're calling a 360 degree view of campaign 2012. And what we mean by that is that we want to explore this uh, election from many different angles to kind of isolate what could be some of the key factors uh, that tip the result one way or the other. Um, you know, polling today has pretty much converged, we're actually meeting at a good time, because the polling has pretty much converged, both nationally and in the states. Um, uh, pretty consistently now in polling, President Obama holds a lead of about three points nationally over uh, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, but is below the 50% mark himself, and his approval rating usually is just below the 50% rating as well, which suggests that today this is a campaign that is within the reach for either side to win, and as I said, a campaign that will ultimately be tipped one way or the other by a series of factors. And what we want to do this morning is focus in on three of these in particular. The trajectory of the economy, the demography of the electorate, and the tactics and strategies of the campaigns themselves. And to explore this uh, for you this morning, we have a, we have a great panel. Uh, to my immediate right is David Leonhardt, who is the Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Times and a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, economic columnist as well, as a, and as a two-time finalist, which means loser, for the Pulitzer Prize <laughs> myself, I say that with utterly no bitterness. Um, to his right uh, is my colleague at National Journal, Charlie Cook, the eponymous publisher of the Cook Political Report and one of our premier analyst not only of presidential elections but congressional elections. He writes a column every week in National Journal where I do as well and as well for our National Journal daily publications. And we're hoping uh, uh, in a few minutes to be joined as well by um, Molly Ball from The Atlantic. So, I get a cries every time I open a Cracker Jack. So yeah, that's, that's, that, that that's terrific. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to talk about these three areas in, in depth. Uh, but I want to start by asking you a broad question. As we said today, with the polling converged and Obama pretty consistently slightly ahead of Romney, but still ominously for an incumbent below 50 percent, if we're going to talk about as these three areas we're going to talk about today, the trajectory of the economy, the ultimate makeup, the demography of the electorate, and the tactics of the campaigns themselves, including things like performance in the debates and the kind of conventions they mount, rank them in your view from the most to the least significant in shaping the ultimate result. We're going in descending order. Descending order. Right. So the economy is most important. There have been only three elections since World War II, and I may forget one of the three, and you'll help me here, in which the ultimate outcome was not uh, extremely close to what it would have been predicted by the direction of the economy in the year <clears throat> before the presidential election. And those three all have obvious reasons. It's Watergate when Gerald Ford did much less well than you would have expected. It's 68, when the Democrats did much less well than you would have expected because of Vietnam. And it's Eisenhower, who had a personal popularity unlike anybody in, in public life today. Um, with those three exceptions, um, uh, the economy just is enormously important. Even 2000, people think, how did Gore lose with that great economy? The economy was slowing really markedly in 2000. Um, and so you look at that, and you look at what the economy is doing now, and it would argue for a very close election. Um, uh, and that means that although I think demography is less important than the state of the economy, and tactics are even less important than either, and I actually think they trail the other two by quite a bit, I still think this election is going to be close enough that tactics could matter. Charlie? I will go exactly with the same sequence, economy, demography, and tactics. Um, on the economy, I would just sort of look at it a different way. The, the, the predictor that has the best historic track record of predicting presidential elections is change in real personal disposable income. And if you look at change from a year earlier, uh, right now this one looks most like where it was in 1980 
when Ronald Reagan was upsetting Jimmy Carter, uh, upset, beat badly Jimmy Carter, um, and then the next three closest to where it is in terms of real disposable income, the party in the White House were all thrown out as well. So I, I'd say that by the economy that you, it, it's extremely difficult for an incumbent to get reelected with the economic circumstances we have today. Not impossible, but real uphill. The only yeah. thing I'd add yeah. to that, and I mean, I've spent much of the last six months telling Democrats that I think they're too optimistic, so it's strange for me to, mm. to be coming at it from the other end. But um, if, if you look at a full menu of, of economic indicators, I think the income one is one of the most pessimistic for Obama. I think if you were to look at employment and some other things, they're more hopeful for him. And when you kind of put it all in the stew, that's where I end up with more of a toss-up than Romney as a favorite. So, uh, just to push yeah. back very slightly, the, the problem with unpo unemployment is that if you then look at U6, you look at all these other measurements yep. of extended unemployment and, and the labor participation rate that the 8182, it's actually a lot worse than that. And so I think it understates the severity of the problem. I, I would answer the question. I think tactics also are the least important. But I, I think there's an interplay between the economy and demography that could be important here. I think, as Charlie said, you look at kind of the, the broad range of numbers. Today, they would tilt away from re-election, particularly wrong track. You know, the idea of an incumbent president being re-elected with 60% or more of the country saying they're on the wrong track is a historic, as the saying goes. Um, what could save, if, if Obama is going to be saved, I think demography will be central to it uh, in terms of both uh, their ability to continue and maybe even accelerate the growth of the minority share of the electorate, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, and also whether the key elements of their constituency, of their coalition, are feeling a little bit better about the economy than the public overall, and that allows him to survive further erosion among the groups that, that um, uh, that he had trouble with in the first place. And you're thinking of Ohio. I'm I'm, well, that. yeah, and I'm also, thinking of, I'm also thinking of upscale whites as opposed to downscale whites, which I want to ask you a question about in a minute. But David, let, let, me, let me kind of, kind of setting that up, as, and now let's kind of talk about these individual buckets. So let's start with, you know, since, since you both agree that the, the trajectory of the economy, an important point, the trajectory of the economy uh, is the critical factor. What do you think Obama can expect between now and November? What's the ratio of good news to bad news that, he can, that he's likely to be looking at? I think the most likely scenario is that the economy will improve a bit between now and the election. Uh, I think if you look what happened at the very beginning of this year, we had a real nice burst in job growth. And it sort of looked like for a couple of months, whoa, are we going to get 200,000 jobs every month? Are we going to get a nice pickup in income? Uh, and is Obama actually going to become a pretty solid favorite? Could this resemble 96, where the year started and it was sort of a toss-up, and then the economy strengthened, and by the summer everyone thought Clinton was a pretty strong favorite? I don't think Obama's going to get that. But I, I think that the um, probably one of the main factors that's gotten less attention than it should in the slowdown since the start of the year, the, the third consecutive spring slowdown, is gas prices. Gas prices went way up. They got really high about, uh, I, I don't hold me to this, six months ago, you know, some number of months ago, just in time to really pull back the economy in the spring, and now they've stopped rising. They've even fallen a little bit. And so I would guess, um, instead of job growth around 100,000, they could, that we could get it up to 150. We could even have another month maybe of 200. Um, I don't think we're going to have 200 fairly consistently, and I would put a huge margin of error around that. The, the main thing to remember about the economy is the rogoff Reinhardt theory. This is this book by Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt called This Time. It's different this time, right? What's, it, what's the actual title of it? Some, this, time is different. this Time is Different. This Thank Time you. is Different. Thank you. And um, uh, what that says is that in the wake of financial crises, you have recoveries unlike any other time. They're long and slow and uneven and they're miserable. And typically, unemployment rises for more than five years. We are ahead of that thanks to the extremely aggressive response of the federal government. But we're still living through that. And so I think we'll have a really weak economy this year. But, but slightly, the trend line slightly up. I, I mean, 60% chance right. that it'll be slightly up. Yep. Uh, yeah. OK. I'd go um, about the same all the way through with a greater chance of it being worse than best, than better. I mean, to me, you look at the just sort of the global economic slowdown. You look at it, what's going on in Europe. You look at public doubts, increasing doubts over the fiscal cliff. Uh, I think uh, I think unemployment's likely to go higher than lower, and growth is, you know, two-ish, for you know, through through. So 
I don't. I think this is a very, very hard situation for for for. And we'll get over into the demographics, yeah. but for all the key groups, it's like this isn't the cruise they signed up for. Right now, you know, most most political strategists and political scientists believe that trajectory matters more than level. In other words, the issue is not so much where the economy is on the day of the election or the period right before the election. It's it's kind of the direction and the expectations of the public. And you know, one way of uh, kind of uh, one one, one uh, trend that underscores that is that uh, in our Heartland Monitor polling at the National Journal and others, if you ask people how they're doing today, uh, they don't. It isn't really much better than what they said a year ago. But what did improve? quite a bit from last summer through this spring and saw Obama's approval ratings rise with it were expectations of for the future. We hmm. saw an increase in the share of Americans who thought the economy was going to be better in a year uh, than it is now. Charlie, that's beginning to get punctured, right? Yes. I mean, we've now seen conference boards drop four months in a row. University of Michigan's the lowest this year. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there was a, there was a burst of enthusiasm and now it's sort of given way, given away a different direction. But I, I think the other thing that, that probably a lot of folks in this particular crowd would probably be thinking though is, but it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. He inherited all this. And that's, it's absolutely, totally true. But once you take the oath of office every single month, you take a little bit more ownership of that economy than the month before. And by the time you get to up for re-election, it's yours. And if it's getting better, you deserve the credit, whether you, you get the credit, whether you deserve it or not. And if it's not getting better, well, you get the blame. And, and, and so even though everybody remembers when it, when it went to hell and under who it went to hell, that's not as, as, as relevant right now. And, and I, I think there's also a, a, another aspect of it is people kind of remember that the focus for the first two and a half years of the of this administration wasn't on the economy. Well, what do you say then? I mean, the stimulus plan was brief and 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 not well accepted. A nine hundred, but it was, it was a very large. I mean, it, it had more uh, spending on domestic uh, discretion, discretionary public investment type programs than Clinton was able to do in his entire four years. I mean, that was a big chip they put down on the table. And uh, generally considered not big enough. And then you go to cap and trade, or and then big. you go to health care. Yeah. So, and, and, but health care, I mean, it's, it's impossible to argue that health care reform didn't dominate the first two years in office. And yeah. at a time when people, by leaps and bounds, believe the economy yeah. is the, the biggest thing. L let me ask you another question about the expectations. Because one thing that struck me, and, and we'll talk about this more in a few minutes, uh, you know, the, 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 the evolution of each side's coalition where what I've called a class inversion where Democrats now depend more on the white upper middle class than they do on the white working class and the working class component of the Democratic coalition is heavily minority. But one thing that was interesting in this polling earlier this year was we began to see more of a divergence in expectations for the future mm -hmm. between white collar America, which was starting to feel pretty good in, uh, in probably in part not only because of the overall trajectory of the economy, because of what was happening in the stock market, maybe home, home values to some extent, and working class America where there was just no improvement. I mean, there's no, just still extremely pessimistic about uh, not only the short-term future, but the long-term future and, and their ability of kids to match their, their lifestyle. So um, do you think, uh, is there uh, the possibility, either of you, that, this diver that we will see a significant divergence in attitudes about the economy, that there is more of a recovery in the places where many of the people in this room live than there are in more blue-collar or rural parts of America which are not feeling any better at all? And could that have an effect on the ultimate result? Well, I mean, working class whites are 38 percent of the electorate. Um, people in this room, with all due respect, 35. Well, I was thinking about one. Well, there you go. <laughs> well at least at least college-educated whites yeah. are 35. Well, yeah, but we're we're talking the the high end of that. But uh, I, I yeah, I mean, I, I to be working class. I mean, you've written about this many, many, many times, but non-college educated whites, you know, the president lost them 58-40, and um, uh, right now looks on track to not be able right. to cover that number again. Right, but I, I guess I'm asking, is it, do you see any possibility that uh, there will be portions, that, that there will be a divergence in assessments of the economy between kind of more upper middle class America and lower middle class America? Because that could be significant if in fact it occurs. Absolutely, I mean, you look at, you look, for all of this silly talk that college isn't worth it anymore, 
um, uh, you look at the, at the gap between what college graduates make and what everyone else makes, and it is at an all-time high. So, so the college graduates have suffered because we've just been through the worst recession in 70 years. So if you had a choice between living through the worst recession in 70 years and not living through the worst recession in 70 years, I would recommend B. But if you don't have that choice and you then have to choose college or not college, I would recommend A, right? This gap is wider than it's ever been. Mm. And so it would make absolute sense that college graduates would have a more upbeat view of the economy. And this now goes into area where you are literally yeah. the, world, the world's leading expert. But, so it seems that would then go into areas where you could imagine Colorado and, mm. and maybe North Carolina and uh, opening Virginia. up more for, and Virginia, which is a better example than North Carolina, opening up more for Obama um, uh, and him putting together this coalition where he can win without Florida or Ohio. But then there's this other funny dynamic, right, which is the auto bailout and the mm -hmm. fact that manufacturing is coming back pretty well. Um, uh, the Democrats sort of uh, nominated someone who's not that good with the blue collar. The Republicans nominated someone right. who might actually be worse, yeah. Yeah. right? And so, right. Um, and, and so there is this a little bit funny thing in which while the white collar is doing much better, I do think there's a chance that portions of the blue collar economy are coming back fast enough mm -hmm. um, that, that that is still where the, where the ultimate battle and is. And I know, Charlie, you've pointed out uh, quite accurately in a recent column that only four times in our history have the popular vote and the Electoral College vote diverged. Actually, three, three. times they split. The fourth time, 1824. We didn't really know. No, they both went one way, and uh, the House ended up Right, picking the, the other, way. right. So, so the three <laughs> times popular vote in Electoral College. Four times diverged. the winner of the popular vote has not been the president. OK. Right. Um, That's usually not the question discussed. Um, uh, <laughs> but now, here's my question. So even, even conceding, you know, just stipulate that, that usually they go the same way. You know, talk about, the, as David kind of alluded to, the, the differing economic experience. And we, we now have two sets of swing states, right? We have a Rust Belt set of swing states, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Iowa, um, and Wisconsin. Wisconsin. And, then, and then New Hampshire kind of fitting in there. Older, white, except for New Hampshire, heavily manufacturing base. Now we have this new set of Sun Belt swing states that used to be Republican-leaning states, but are now truly, you know, kind of in play to various degrees. Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, the Southeastern Conference, and then we have the Southwestern Conference of Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico. The economies are, generally speaking, in those, uh, many of those states, better than the nation overall, or at least seeing some more improvement, but they, but they diverge as well. So you want to talk, does that matter, well, the local economies? I, I, I think it, it matters, but I think it matters sort of who these people are. I mean, one of the things that's driving, you know, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, certainly those southwestern states, one of the things that's driving it is, is they're getting a lot of transplants, uh, college-educated, upscale people from other parts of the country that are making that state more like the norm in the middle of the country, you know, the norm of the country, but you've also has, have a rising Hispanic population that's driving a lot of that as well, even in places that you wouldn't necessarily guess, like North Carolina and Virginia. You know, but the catch there is, while the president looks on track to hit, you know, the same 67 percent he got last time, uh, there is no real sign that, that turnout among Latinos is going to be remotely where it was last time. And even post-Dream Act polling doesn't show that excitement jeering up. So the thing about it is turnout among Latinos has always been at a certain level. It spiked up in 2008. And there's no evidence that it's going to be that it's not going to be normal this time. But yet, uh, well, 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 and that's what's driving some of these newer states. No, these newer states into the into the Democratic camp. It's the combination, you know. In a, in a conversation I had with David Axelrod after the 2010 election, and we talked about Michael Bennett here in Colorado. Maybe we'll kind of segue now into uh, into demographics. You know, Michael Bennett. Uh, you know, David uh, Axelrod kind of uh, agreed that the Bennett model, the Bennett coalition was kind of where they may have to go. And let's explain what that was. I mean, Michael Bennett won by uh, generating a significant minority turnout, doing well among young voters, uh, and performing well among college-educated whites, especially women, allowed him to survive an utter pasting among rural, blue-collar, and older whites. He lost two out of three among non-college white men. Now, um, there are places where that coalition works and places where that coalition doesn't work. But when you look at polling today, how optimistic or concerned, we'll talk about turnout in a minute, but how optimistic or concerned should Obama be about his ability to hold that basic coalition of young people, minority voters, and college-educated whites, especially women? Is that coalition sticking with him, Charlie? Well, young people, he's going to win comfortably, but not where he was. I mean, he got 66% of the mm -hmm. vote in, among 18 to 29-year-olds last time, and right now he's, uh, he's, he's got 56% of the vote uh, 
uh, against Romney. He beats Romney spoke, 56. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the Gallup three-week moving right. average, so it's 9,000 interviews. They'll be releasing the, an additional fresher week this, uh, t later today. But the thing is, he's on a track for 56 percent, not 66 percent. We got last time, and then, of course, the, you said to turn out, talk about turnout later, but the turnout, there's just not a pulse on campuses well, right yeah, well, now. So let's, let's talk about this, because David, because I mean, I think, with, you know, if you look at, if you look at Obama's the modern democratic coalition, which is wh whose, whose evolution toward he is accelerating. I've called it the coalition of the ascendant because it represents groups that are themselves growing in society. And we'll come back to that because it may uh, offset some of the turnout issue. So if you look at, you know, consistently now in polling, he is still running. In, in 2008, he won 80% of all non-white voters. And he's, he's holding very close to that in almost every poll. And he wins every non-white group, right? He wins Everyone, Asian every, Americans pretty He's over 60% with yeah. everybody. Two thirds among Hispanics, over nine out of 10 among African Americans. Um, college educated whites, he won 47% of them. That broke down to 42% of the men. Not so great, but 52% of the college white women. And Charlie, he is holding very close to that in most polling among uh, the college white women. Uh, the young people are drifting off a little bit, but by and large, the groups that stayed with him are largely still there. The difference, the, the challenge is, the groups that tilted away from him last time, which are primarily the blue-collar whites, both men and women, and the college white men, they're tilting further away. I mean, they are moving further away, and it's possible, as Charlie noted before, he could see just historically low numbers among working-class uh, white voters. When you look at the economy, his agenda, his position on social issues, the whole gamut, what does he have in his toolbox to try to reach out to working class whites, and even if it's just to hold down the erosion from 08? I mean, I think what he has in his toolbox explains along a lot of what their tactics are, right? What he has in his toolbox is making the case to working class white voters that, hey, the other guys are really not on your side. <laughs> the other guys want to cut taxes really deeply for the well-off. You think we're bad on Wall Street, the other guys are worse, right? Uh, and I think that explains why, despite little bubbles of criticism about the Bain stuff, they are not backing off the Bain stuff at all. And I don't mean to take us straight into tactics, but right. I think, I mean, I think what, what the case they can make is, hey, you may be disappointed with us, right? But if you're a younger person, you have no tolerance for the Republican Party position on gay marriage, on immigration, on some of these social liberal things. And then they will make a similar case, which will be harder for them to make to working class voters. Hey, you may be disappointed in us, but the other guys are really on the opposite team from you, and sure. you're angry now. How, I mean, that is the classic choice versus referendum tug of war between incumbent and challenger. How much mileage can they get with that kind of argument, particularly with those working class voters? Well, we kind of got into this uh, the other night at the, at, the, at the belly up session, but we're, um, there's, in a different, slightly different formulation, to me this is a two-step process. And number one, uh, referendum on the president, yes, no, or maybe. And if the answer is not yes, then you say, um, okay, is the other guy acceptable? I think with the economy where it's been, where it is, and where I think it's likely to be, I think he loses the rejection. But maybe it goes to the maybe. And then you get over to the maybe, and the question is, I think their only chance of reelection is basically destroying Romney and basically making him an unacceptable choice. And I think that Romney, and don't want to get into the tactics that's mm. later on, but, I want to, but, but that the fact that the Romney campaign has never bothered to tell people who he is or flesh him out as a human being, um, they are uniquely vulnerable to this. So, but I, I, don't think that, I don't think that lower income whites are getting any positive messaging from the president whatsoever. And all they're getting is the negative messaging. And maybe, maybe it works. With the one exception, as you noted, I think before, in the upper Midwest, the potential for the auto bailout perhaps being the yeah. one positive message he can take into those communities. And, and it is a reality that both last time and this time, he polls better among working class whites in Ohio than just about anywhere else. I mean, it's, it, it is sort of an anomaly there. Um, and Wisconsin and Michigan, those three states, uh, 
he can win without Ohio. Michigan and Wisconsin, especially Michigan, very difficult to, to overcome. How much of an asset could that be for him in those areas? I think it can be a significant asset because, as Charlie mentioned, the stimulus isn't popular, right? One of the problems with responding to these financial crises is that Keynesian economics is just not popular. <laughs> Let's set aside the debate about whether it works. It's not popular. And even the people who think it works uh, acknowledge it's not popular. And so it's hard to go out and sell the stimulus. You can go out and sell the auto bailout, right? That is something tangible. It has a story. It, it sort of makes sense. I mean, what's interesting to me is their positive story even there, though, is so backward looking, right? Think about it. It's, it's, it's a past tense. We saved, not we will. And they've made this decision that they are not going to go out and tell a story about, hey, you elect us and right. we're going to do A, right. B, and C. And when you say this to them, they get very angry and they say, that's not true at all. We've got positions, papers, you know, more position papers than you can ever read. But having position papers is different than telling Americans, hey, you elect us and we'll do one, two, three. Now, I am somewhat sympathetic to their not doing that because it wouldn't be honest. They can't do those things if Congress looks at all like what I'm guessing you expect it to look like. But still, politics suggests you should tell that story. The fact that they're not is sort of an interesting decision. And the fact that they're not, and this may be blurring from demographics the tactics, but we talked about this the other night and we've written about this. Uh, it is striking the way they are approaching their coalition. As David said, there really is not an overarching national economic message at the center of this campaign. What has been a much more central is an effort to find individual issues that animate different components of their coalition. So, and, 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 and in effect, to create wedge issues you know, from the left, which is not something we've seen much in national politics, but for trying to generate interest and turnout among Hispanics, we've had the DREAM Act legalization uh, and the ardent opposition to the Arizona law, including after the Supreme Court decision. Uh, for, for women, so especially socially liberal women, they focus on access to contraception, uh, the, the Pay Equity Act, the Violence Against Women Act, young people, student loans, um, but, and, then, and then kind of wrapping it all together with assaults on Romney and Bain, but without kind of this central you know, re-elect me, and here are the five things I'm going to do to make the economy work better in the second term than the first. Um, what do you make of that kind of strategy, which is, which is a little different than what we've seen from Democrats uh, in the past? I'm assuming that they have looked at this and said, the old way doesn't work anymore. That, that just the messaging for the people in this room is just totally different from the messaging to a group of people 60 miles away in some little town and that it is what it is, and, and, and targeting is the way to go. And I don't know that they're wrong, um, but I, I, you know, I, I personally think that they're paying a price for policy decisions the first two years, and they're, doing, they're, playing, they're playing the best hand they've got. And David, it, I'm sorry, Charlie. Yeah, no, no, you know, one thing that really strikes me about this strategy is that it seems to me to go further than any Democratic nominee has gone toward accepting what their coalition is now and how it has evolved from what their coalition was historically. I mean, the New Deal coalition that Democrats kind of grew up on was centered on working class voters, especially whites, and older voters. You know, and in 2008, as Charlie noted, 58% of non-college whites voted for uh, uh, McCain. So did 58% of white seniors. In 2010, that went over 60% voting Republican in each case. And if you look at each of the issues that I've noted that he is using to try to activate different components of his base, almost all of them further complicate his relationship with the most culturally conservative yes. components of the white electorate who are older and blue collar. So it seems, at least from my end, that they have really crossed a Rubicon here. Uh, you know, you look at the first two years, one, one reason why they did not do immigration reform was because all of these Democratic blue dogs from conservative blue collar rural districts said, if you do this, we'll get slaughtered. We can't do this. They all got slaughtered anyway, even yeah. though they didn't do it. So has Obama, in your mind, I mean, is he kind of making a leap here in this election? toward a very different democratic coalition than certainly uh, we would remember from even as recently as 25 and 30 years ago. Yes, but he's also still trying to have it both ways, right? So if you look at something like gay marriage, and I will, I will say that I don't completely accept his narrative that this is just naturally when he came to it. I think there may have been some politics involved. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the DREAM Act, uh, they're exactly what you're saying, yeah. right? They are not saying, wait a second, we got to worry about that voter in Elyria, Ohio, right? The white working class voter. They're saying something else, right? Um, uh, and, so, and so I think, I think that's absolutely right. Right. At the same time, the Bain strategy right, is clearly trying to hold on to. It's saying, hey, you know what? We're not going to worry about the tisk tisking we get from the elites about the private equity thing. We're going to go after and try to win some votes. I mean, to me, that raises a question that actually, yeah. I'm not the sure, moderator, no, no, but no, I'd no, like no, to ask each yeah, of you. We're, which we're, is, all, we're all equal. I, I think, 
I, I mean, I think part of what this is, is, is they, they're looking at the, the numbers that say young people are just lean so heavily Democratic today. And that, this, contrary to popular wisdom, is not the way it always is, right? For the 80s and 90s, there were not huge right. age gaps. And so I think in some ways, it's in part a long-term strategy. And the question I'd be interested in, in what you guys think about is, how confident should Democrats be that the people who today are between the ages of 18 and 30 or 18 and 40 will remain leaning Democratic for life? And I just don't know the answer. That, well, that. that plays into something else I was going to say, is, is that first of all, the seniors that behaved a certain way for so yeah. long they grew up in the Depression. They grew up in World War II, where the federal right. government could tackle something and succeed. And their life experience and their view of government was so different. And, and very, very sadly, most of those people are gone now. Right. And the people that have replaced them, 65 up, have had a very different experience with government. And so they're just different people. And so the, the fact that the Obama campaign may have different relationship with seniors, it, it, it may have to do in part with the fact that the seniors changed. And then with these young people, I mean, I do think that, that, that voters tend to cement their, their political leanings early in life. And for Republicans four years ago, that had to have been a terrifying suggestion mm -hmm. with where things are. Now, I don't know what it means because you have a kid walking across the stage last month getting their college diploma, and the economy was in the toilet the first day freshman year. The economy was in the toilet every single day they were in college, and now that they've moved back into the basement, um, it's it, it, it still, and, and so the thing is, it, 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 it doesn't mean that they don't like President Obama a great deal, but that this, as I said earlier, the cruise of the cruise they signed up for, and this hope change thing, I mean, you go on a, poll, a college campus, there isn't a political pulse right now. And so for him to get that kind of elevated Ooh. turnout from 08, um, uh, you, to me, it's know, a fantasy. There are a couple different elements of the democratic strength among young people, some of which are likely to endure this immediate problem, and others are now much more questionable. Part of it, a big part of it, a big part of the reason Obama won two-thirds of young people is that this is the most diverse generation in American history. Um, you know, 2011 was the tipping point where a majority of American newborns were non-white. And 47% uh, of Americans overall, 47% of Americans under 18 today are non-white. And we talk about the majority-minority country somewhere distantly in the future, but on the under 18 population, we will be majority-minority right around 2020 maybe as early as 2020 or 2021. So that is a big part of it. A big part of why Democrats are getting these elevated margins among young people is that many of them are minority voters who are voting Democratic at whatever age. But the other part of it was that Obama did win a majority of whites under 30. He won 55% of whites under 30. And that had a variety of components to it. One part of that that will continue to benefit Democrats is this is a very socially liberal, tolerant is a better word, socially tolerant generation. They don't get what the fuss is about gay marriage, for example. And so that will be an advantage for Democrats in reaching those voters. But as Charlie said, the opportunity that was there for Obama to really build a lasting majority was is if this economy had produced results for those young people, he clearly had an opportunity to cement their lasting loyalty. And I think in the white electorate, it's going to be much more contested this time. He will do better, and he does better in polls, among whites under 30 by far than any other age group uh, among whites. But it's I think it's unlikely that he will win a majority of them again. Now, he doesn't have to win a majority of them again to win, but that's where I think, so, so some of this is kind of you know, the larger demographic story, um, but uh, the, the opportunity has been somewhat constricted uh, by the economy. I want to ask you, um, you know, even in 2008, you know, we're talking about how, how this country has changed. In 2008, Barack Obama was the first candidate in history to lose whites by double digits and win. Not only win, but win big. Win the biggest Democratic victory since Johnson in 64. And that was because, as we said, he won 80% of all non-whites. And they were 26% of the total vote, which was more than double their share in 1992. When Clinton was elected, they were 12. The decline in that intervening period has entirely been among those working class whites. The college white mm. has stayed unmoving at 35%. So, um, Charlie, um, you know, you, you were talking about the turnout before. The turnout really, or the share of the electorate, is a function of two factors. The turnout, but also the pool, the, the number of eligible voters. There are, there are two million more eligible Hispanics than four years ago. Um, I think that's right. I think it's two million. Um, uh, so my question to you is, even if turnout is disappointing, uh, can the underlying demography give Obama an increase 
in the minor minority share of the vote? And can he win if it doesn't? Can he match his 43% among whites from last time? I don't think it's growing, mean, particularly peeling out Texas, peeling out California, all that. But when you're looking at 77% at of all registered voters saying, of registered voters saying that they're definitely going to vote, 77% versus only 62% of, of, of Hispanics, a 15 point differential, that's really huge. And there hadn't been that much growth to make up for, to make up for that. And, and so I don't, and you look at the NBC Wall Street Journal, Paul says the same, mm -hmm. that, that, that I don't, I don't see any, I don't see any chance that the percentage of the Latino electorate this election Ooh, will equal 2008. That is a, that's an interesting prediction because certainly there, there will be million, I think, it, I believe it is two million more eligibles. So that would be striking. But of course, that, you know, the, there's a denominator issue here, yep. which we saw in 2010. We saw an enormous turnout of conservative, especially older whites. Seniors were the biggest share of the electorate in the 2010 midterm. They've been in any midterm uh, in the history of polling. How much does Obama have to, we've been talking about their efforts, and we'll switch to tactics in a moment, their efforts uh, to kind of mobilize their electorate, what they see as their electorate, but how much of a risk do they face of just a sheer flood of older, rural, uh, blue collar, the most conservative portions of the white electorate? They face a big risk. I think that's why you see these Medicare wars continuing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Medicare, this isn't my point, um, uh, but Medicare for a long time was the third rail, and now it'll probably be a central feature of every campaign for a long time, right? Because both parties see it as an incredibly important way to distinguish their own view from the other party. So that's why you see the Republicans harping on these Medicare cuts in the health care law. It's why you see the Democrats spending so much time talking about Paul Ryan's plan. Um, uh, people above 65 vote in huge numbers, and, and, and Medicare seems to be the sort of battleground. And I think the fact that you see that attention speaks to exactly the fear that your question is getting. Let's talk tactics. Charlie, um, the assumption among many of us, I don't know if you've shared this, has been that money matters less in presidential elections than any other election, both both because people are voting on the circumstances of their, of their life, but also because they're exposed to so much free media. But we are seeing the potential for enormous sums and potentially a wide disparity, amazingly, with an incumbent president cumulatively being outspent uh, by the Republicans, particularly the independent groups. Could, uh, could that kind of, should all of us be uh, kind of uh, checking our conventional wisdom again that this doesn't matter? I think, I think that's a very good way of putting it. I, if, you know, a month, two, three months ago, I would have said, look, I don't think money will be a decisive factor in this presidential election, that President Obama is going to raise and spend between you know, 700 billion and a billion, Romney's going to spend and raise and spend between 700 billion, toss in the super PACs on both sides. It, you know, that you were, you were not going to see a terrific imbalance, and I think that there is a law of diminishing returns in terms of effectiveness of advertising. After a certain point, it, it, you know, somebody out spending somebody three to two and they're both spending massive amounts of money and, uh, it would make a difference. And just put in context, you know, that, that President Obama in 2008 uh, raised and spent, it was just a touch under 700 million, right? And half mm -hmm. of that was to beat Hillary Clinton. Right. And he still outspent McCain three to one. And so 700 million is not a pittance in any way He'll probably end up with super, I'd get close to a billion. But the, there's a point of, I guess, of is there a tipping point where the imbalance gets so great that it does make a difference? And, and you know, we might get there. I, I personally think that the tipping point in terms of super PACs and all this is a lot more likely to be on the congressional mm -hmm. side yeah. where you don't have this saturation spending like President Obama and Governor Romney will have, uh, I think it's more likely to impact down there, but it could get bad enough that makes uh, a difference. Political scientists, for whom I have great regard, are very skeptical of the effect of money right. in presidential elections. And so I think it's fair to start this with some skepticism. Having said that, I don't see how you, you don't look at the Republican primaries, and, and as, as I think you're suggesting, head into this race with some thought that money could really matter, because they were so important in the Republican primaries. I mean, they really, every time Romney hit a, a rough patch, you know, more money, more advertising, it kind of carried him through. And so I do think, one, if you were going to make a list of big questions about this election, I don't know, 10 or 20 questions, one of them that I would add to the list is, does big Democratic money get off the sidelines more than it has so you, far? You know, it's just one other, one other aspect, and we'll bring 
the audience in a minute. One other aspect of the money is where they're choosing to spend. The Obama campaign is making an enormous investment. If the ads, if the ads are aimed at the numerator, the Obama campaign is making enormous investment on the denominator. I mean, they're spending a lot of money trying to change the composition of the electorate. But as Charlie, I, I think, alluded to a little bit before, the paradox they face, David, as you know very well, is the groups, with the exception of the college white women, the groups at the core of their coalition are also some of the groups that are being hammered hardest by the recession, whether yes. you look at Hispanics, African Americans, or young people. So, I mean, how would you, would, how, uh, how much of a headwind is that for engaging an electorate that may agree with you on issues and be closer to you on issues, but really not much that you can say to them when they ask, are you better off than you were four years ago? I think it definitely matters. And I actually think that's, I think that is a much more meaningful way to slice the country than states. But you'll read a lot of stories and see a lot of reports over the next several months, I hope not too many in the New York Times based on what I'm about to say, mm -hmm. slicing and dicing swing state economies. I wouldn't pay that much attention to those reports. I think the national economy is what sets the real narrative and then I think there are people's personal experiences. But I think slicing it the way you just sliced it, which is looking at the fact that the economy has been so much harder on the young than the old, which is not to say it's been good on the old. Again, it's like the college, non-college thing. I think that has the potential to be one of those factors in a very close election that could be determinative. When and when you look at, for example, Hispanic vote, young Hispanics, so that's the intersection of two different yeah. incredibly depressed groups. Um, wow, that really is some. But I think, though, that the mobilization route that the Obama campaign's doing, um, they really have to do this. Because if, if President Obama's reelection is dependent upon winning um, half of the undecided votes, it's, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's not. And, and one of the things that was really interesting is NBC and the Wall Street Journal, their pollsters, Peter Hart and Bill McInturf, combined the first five months of their polls, their first five months, January through May. Mm -hmm. And they consulted together 3,800 interviews of that 260 are with undecided voters. So comparing all registered voters with the undecideds. Among all registered voters, 32% of registered voters think the country's headed in the right direction. 32%, 59 wrong track. Among just the undecideds, 15 right direction, 71 wrong track. Uh, President Obama's job rating for those five months, overall 48, 46. Among undecideds, 24 approve. 59 disapproved. Did you do the fave on fave on Romney? Because I, I was looking yep. last week in some of the swing states, very similar, but also Romney really uh, underwater among those same voters. Well, th that's what's interesting. Obama, in, though this is not job rating, this is positive right. negative, okay? Obama image among undecideds, 27 positive, 49 negative. Mm -hmm. And for Romney, nine positive, yeah. 49 negative. Right, right. So their negatives are identical but they don't know anything positive about Mitt Romney because his campaign has never told his story. They won the nomination tactically, organizationally, you know, outmaneuvering Newton, Santorum, and all this, but they never said, here's a three-dimensional human being with a life story and a family and someone that may not necessarily be a cold-hearted, ruthless bastard. And in the, uh, a, a, a life story and a family, a life story and a family. They don't want to mention the dog, though. Yeah. In in the Romney campaign's defense, they couldn't have won the nomination telling his full story, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, that was part of it. Right. But they've had since yeah. April. Before, yes. before you go, yes. before you go to the audience, let me, like, just button up this section with, one, with just one point of my own. You know, we mentioned before Obama only won forty three percent of whites in two thousand and eight. Uh, first person ever lose whites by double digits and win. I think we'd all agree, given everything we're seeing in polling and the economy, it's going to be very hard for him to match that number. It's going to be it almost certainly going to come in below that. That has implications for governance that we, we're going to talk about at the end. But in terms of the election, it really does underscore the second question of whether they can continue to grow the minority share of the total electorate. Because each point, it was 26% of the vote was non-white in 2008. Their internal estimate is that they can push that up. They and demography will push that up to 28 if it, if it goes to 28 in 2012, and he holds 80% of them, which he shows every sign of doing, he could win re-election with less than 40% of whites, slightly less than 40% of the white vote. If it doesn't go up, obviously, he has to get closer. And this is the kind of election where each one of those points 
is going to be enormous. You know, whether Obama needs 41% or 39.5% of whites to win is going to be a significant variable. So, you know, and uh, uh, the, the, the ability to increase that minority share and to hold, in particular, those college white women who are with him on social issues are going to be absolutely essential. And I, personally, I think the election is going to be decided much more in the white upper middle class than in the white working class, which seems ready to stampede against him. If Obama wins re-election with 41% of the white vote, which you're saying is, is plausible, right. what percentage of white men does he win? Uh, he probably, you know, he, uh, he will win, I, I, I've had to do the, figure out the thing, but he'll win about, he's going to win 35% or less of non-college white men. And a, the, the big variables here are, you know, look, look at it this way. He won 40% of non-college whites and 47% of college whites. The third consecutive Democratic nominee who did better among college than non-college after the reverse was true from Roosevelt all the way through Dukakis. The likelihood is overwhelming, as Charlie said way back when, that that 40% number among non-college whites is going to go down, both among men yep. and women, probably 36, 37. The issue becomes how close can he stay to that 47? among the college whites. So far, he is. He's staying very close to it. He's right at where he was with college women. He's down slightly with college men. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that is probably the, the key, the two key variables for him are how much can he push up the minority share of the vote and how close can he stay to his white upper middle class vote. He's Charlie, getting 33, 34% of the white males. Yeah. All yeah, in Gallup. All white, oh no, all, Gallup. all white all males. White. Yeah, in Gallup. Now, are there are other polls that are better for him overall because the college white is better. So let's start right over there. Yeah, you, yes. Uh, please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Mark Hannes. Uh, I had a question. You, you spent a lot of time talking about turnout, and that's going to be a key issue. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about both maybe as a strategy and a tactic about voter suppression with all the voter ID mm -hmm. laws and how that'll play both in this election and future elections on, with the whole demographic shift. Yeah, I think it potentially really matters. I mean, I think it is, it is just absolute hardball politics uh, that these Republican governors and legislators are pursuing. And obviously, there are, no one wants voter fraud. The evidence of voter fraud on the scale that people are talking about just isn't there. I mean, not to say it never happens. Um, and, you know, we are talking about um, a, uh, you know, as I said, an election where Obama is poised to win at least 80% of the people who are most likely to be affected by this. You know, there's, there's a kind of short-term, long-term issue here for Republicans, which is that it's clear, I think we all agree, Romney can, can squeeze out a victory by getting somewhere close to 60 or 61 percent, maybe even 62 percent among whites. You don't want to be in a position where you have to do that every four years. Sooner or later, Republicans have to deny Democrats the ability to win 80 percent of minorities in every election, and this kind of strategy is counterproductive for that. But if you're thinking just about getting through this one election, and it's worth noting that no Republican, because of this demographic change, has gotten past 50.8% of the vote since 1988. The ceiling, you know, is lower. But so in the long run, policies like this are counterproductive for them because it becomes implausible at some point to win 63, 64% of whites, if that's what you need, if, you, if Democrats keep winning 80% of minorities. But in this election, it could be significant. Can, can I jump in? Uh, no, I'm from Louisiana. Notwithstanding the Herculean efforts of, of Mayor Landrieu, who I think is just a fabulous mayor, uh, Louisiana has a, a, a history of somewhat, I know this is news to some of you, uh, of, of sordid politics. There is no consequential voter fraud in this country. And if an office was ever st was stolen, it would be more likely to be a rural sheriff's race someplace than any contest of any consequence. I think this is a set of solutions in search of a problem with a problem that doesn't exist. Having said that, I think for Republicans, I think for some of them, this is a political tactic, but I think some of them have an honest to God belief that there is a huge voter fraud in this problem in this country. And, and John Fund at the Wall Street Journal spends a lot of time <laughs> writing about it. But at least in my experience in politics, I don't think it exists. So, but the thing about it is, can this make some of a difference in close races, close places? Uh, yes. But the thing is, to me, the question I have for the people that are pushing, we need to change these voter laws and make them more stringent, is are you going to play, are you going to play on a level playing field? So in other words, in Texas, if you're going to require a state issue photo ID, will, if you're going to accept the concealed carry weapons hmm. permit, you really got to take a University of Texas issued student ID. 
I mean, they both are kind, you know? You yeah. really kind of do both let's, and play let's straight. Let's go over here. Davis, uh, there are many differences between the voting Latino bloc uh, compared to other minorities uh, in the U.S. It depends on whether you're a white Latino, whether you're educated, whether you're of Mexican descent, Cuban descent, Puerto Rican, South American, and, and other locations. I haven't heard anywhere at any time that there are any kinds of studies or statistics that you're taking into account the different kinds of Latino that are in this country, which you have to target in different ways. Are there? And if there yeah. aren't any, oh, oh, you no. should. There's plenty. Uh, there's plenty. I mean, what we're, we're talking about is kind of the net, you know, of how it all comes out. Obama won 67% of the net of everybody in 08, and all polling shows he's in position to equal or more likely slightly exceed that with the issue being turnout. You know, the, one, the biggest, the most important divide in recent years in, in politics have been the one you did not mention, which is between Catholic and evangelical Protestant. Latinos, the Catholic, the Catholic uh, Hispanic vote, uh, uh, with the exception of the other important divide, obviously Cubans behave very differently than everybody else, but, but uh, in terms of the Hispanic community, much more Republican. Um, but uh, when Bush made his big inroads among uh, Hispanics, it was largely among evangelicals. The Catholic Hispanic vote stayed very democratic. Uh, and I, just, I would just point out though, in, in 08, um, as immigration reform faded as a Republican priority and you saw the GOP mobilize against it, you saw very visible expressions of concern from the conser socially conservative evangelical Latinos who felt this was undermining their ability to sell Republicans in that community. Um, and a lot of that has been out there this time. There's been a lot of public anxiety on the part of many of these conservative Hispanic evangelical leaders about the language, the self-deportation, and so forth. So that has been a bit, it, it, there's clearly, you know, you look at attitudes, uh, Hispanics are not African Americans. They're not as um, pro uh, 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 reflexively pro-government, and they are obviously uh, very socially conservative. Um, but uh, Republicans really have not been able to get to those attitudes because of other barriers that they've erected for themselves in the way. The Washington. Pew, the Pew Research Center has an entire institute uh, devoted to studies of, of voter attitudes among Hispanic voters. Yeah. That's very, very good. The Washington Post had an item pointing out how poorly Marco Rubio did among Mexican American voters in his Senate race and raising the question of would he play nationally in the way that a lot of people assume. Let's see, we've got anybody on this side of the room, uh, maybe uh, over there? Oh, sorry. Let me get Get your exercise in. Uh, my name is Marsha Flax, and I just wanted to ask, what do you think the impact would be if Hillary Clinton and Biden exchanged places? Can we do likelihood first? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zero. And, and the thing is that, 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 that first of all, um, I think for President Obama, I mean, and, and let, me, let me preface this, I, I think the world of Secretary Clinton and, and you know, the country would be lucky to have her, is lucky to have her. I think the likelihood of President Obama and his team deciding to announce that the first decision I made as the Democratic nominee for president was a colossal mistake and that I'm going to have to dump my running mate and throw a lifeline to Hillary Clinton, I think the odds of that are somewhere around zero. Uh, and, and the thing is, and if he were 10 points ahead in the polls, if I were her, he'd say, you know, I'm tired, I've been to 100 countries, but what the hell, I'll take it. I don't think if today if it's offered, I kind of doubt if she'd take it. Sir, I, over there. Go ahead, Dave. I, I was going to say, I, I, I would just note Michael Gerson's good line, the former Bush speech writer, which is, at any given moment, Americans are not mainly deciding whether their president is right or left. They're deciding whether he's strong or weak. That would make him look weak. Sir, over here is our mic. Uh, good morning. Thank Bill you. Smithberg is my name. You. You know, understandably, none of you mentioned the deficit or the long-term debt, which is a gargantuan issue, particularly for two generations beyond this room. Why do you not see it as a bigger issue for this election in the dialogue? Well, David Rubenstein and, 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 and Ward Zuckerberg just had a whole panel of that. And that was a, a I mean, Americans are in favor of the deficit. They're deeply in favor of the deficit. When you ask them, are you in favor of the deficit? They say, no, this deficit's terrible. When they say, do you want to cut spending? They say, no, no. Do you want to raise taxes? No, no. So the both campaigns both know this. I agree with you economically, it's extremely important. But given that Americans uh, are against cutting Medicare, are against cutting Social Security, are not so much against cutting the
the military, but they're mm -hmm. not strongly in favor of it, and they're against having their taxes raised. But they will raise the taxes on the top. They will raise the taxes on other people. There's not a lot of, of margin for the candidates so in getting let's, specific. So let's, kind of, let's kind of like look at this, and uh, clearly getting the economy moving overall, job creation will be a bigger issue in the campaign. But certainly, right after the election, it, this will be the immediate challenge they face, and certainly probably the biggest issue they face in 2013 will be whether we can produce a, uh, some sort of long-term plan to bring the deficit under control. One, one aspect of this election that seems to me, and Charlie, this kind of goes to your congressional expertise, the likelihood seems to me that whoever, whichever way this tips in 2012, we're going to be talking about a very closely divided country. Presidential race whose margin of victory will probably be small, almost certainly be small in both the popular and the electoral college vote. A Senate where someone is going to be right around 50-50, one side or the other, and a House where Republicans probably still have the majority, but a diminished majority. So in a closely divided Washington, as David, starting with you, uh, will there be the ability to deal with the deficit, which will be loom certainly as the governing issue of 2013, if not the campaign issue of 2012. And there's this whole, as you're alluding to, there's this thing, tax Maggedon, right, or the fiscal cliff, where we've got all these expiring tax cuts and all this, all these spending cuts that are going to take effect. Uh, I think it's going to be really hard. I mean, I think, uh, I, I think you know, you sort of have to break it out into the two scenarios. If Obama wins, do the Republicans decide that they're willing to compromise in the way that they just weren't in the first term? I don't know. You look mm. at, you, you, if I were a Republican and I decided I wanted to compromise with Obama, the first thing I'd worry about was a primary challenge, mm -hmm. right? And, and if the Republicans win, they're going to have a really strong hand, and I don't think they're going to be looking for a lot of compromise. So um, on the one hand, we've got all this expiring stuff that may force something like the Boehner Obama grand bargain. On the other hand, I don't see it at this moment. I think it's going to take a fairly catastrophic economic market event to focus, to change behavior on Capitol Hill to go a different direction than we've been going. Here's a paradox along the lines of what we were talking about before with Democrats and immigration, the reverse for Republicans. Uh, if they win unified control, they will almost certainly do so because, uh, partly because of exaggerated margins among white seniors, probably 60% plus. In that environment, will every Republican senator on a party line basis through reconciliation vote to convert Medicare into a premium support system as the Ryan plan would do? Will they, will, will they all stand up? And I mean, that is, I think, what many conservatives envision. We get unified control, 50 or 51 Senate seats. We pass something like the Ryan budget on reconciliation, which, uh, which precludes filibusters. And the question I ask is, if, 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 will that be plausible given the constituency that they will most likely mobilize if they are going to win that level of power? Well, I mean, the Ryan plan exempts everyone over 55, right? right. So but it's European style, yes. single payer healthcare right. if you're over 65, right. and market-based healthcare if you're under. So Maybe. I mean, that would be, you're right, they don't believe that, but that would be why they might feel OK to do it. We got anything over here? Sir, right here. Uh-oh, we've got a ringer we've here. We've gone from three to one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you both touched on the uh, congressional races. Charlie, where do you come out on Senate and House races, especially given, I don't know how many, three or four uh, Democratic senators, oh, I think I'm busy. I can't go to the convention. Well, I, I think, let me focus on the last part first. You start having conventions that go into September, and when elected officials sort of have other things to do. And I think they may elect to stay away, particularly if all their donors are not going to the convention either. But anyway, but it just more bottom line congressional. Um, this thing, if because Democrats are 23 seats up and Republicans only have 10 in the Senate, there's such an enormous imbalance. There's not really a question of whether Democrats are going to lose some Senate seats, but how many? And, and obviously, with the Senate right now 53-47, Republicans need three seats if they win the White House, four seats if they don't. Right now, just with the races we have and what we're seeing right now, if Republicans had a bad night, they'd get, 52, they'd get two seats, which would get them to, 50, to 49 and short. And a great night might get them to five seats, which is to 53. Most likely was probably be what Ron said a minute ago, 50-50, give or take. But then you've got this interesting situation with Angus King, the former independent governor of Maine, who's probably going to get elected to the Senate and seems desperately determined to not come down one side or the other. So depending upon who, which side wins the presidency, and if you have a side that wins the presidency, 
at, if, let's say Republicans hypothetically win the presidency and pick up two seats so that they're at 49 seats, that could be interesting. I mean, anything in the two, three seat, either way, Angus King becomes a very, very interesting person. And so my joke that is not fair because I think he's a, a very independent and incredibly sincere guy with a lot of integrity, but the joke would be that we have 32 Senate races and one silent auction for, for Angus King. You know, I, I would just add real quick for another question. Uh, we, are, we are at, as our, all our politics are evolving toward a more parliamentary system where the individual matters less than the broad verdict on your team. The level of split ticket voting, the number of voters splitting their ticket between president and senate is in, at the lowest level since 1960. If you look at even in 2010, mm -hmm. even amid the Republican landslide, there were 10 states with Senate races where Obama's approval rating in the exit poll was 48 or above. Democrats won nine of those 10. There were 15 states in 2010 with Senate races where his approval rating was at 47 or below. Democrats lost 13 of those 15. In 2006, Republicans lost 19 of the 20 states in which Bush was at 45 or below. Olympia Snow, the only one to survive. So you can run, you can run away from Charlotte, but you can't really hide. And, and that really gets the last point, which is that the only thing Charlie didn't mention was, I think a key variable here is going to be not only how many seats Democrat, how many Democratic seats Republicans win, but maybe just as important will be whether Demo how many of the Republican seats Democrats can win in states where Obama is likely to do well. Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, I think. Uh, you know, the whole, picking up two of those forces Republicans to win six if Obama wins, and that's obviously a lot different than winning uh, four. So let's, uh, let's go right here and uh, try to squeeze in a couple more questions, and we'll try to be briefer as well. Following Charlie's comments on the painting, uh, my name is Robert Potter from Dallas. F you're, you talked about painting the picture of Mitt Romney. What percentage of the electorate uh, know what Bain is or Bain Capital? Even more important, what percentage of the minority know what Bain or Bain Capital is? In contrast, same two questions about Olympics. Why don't they stress his role in the Olympics versus Spain? I think I saw something the other day of what percentage awareness of Bain, and it was, it was coming up. Yeah. But you have to divide it up. I mean, the thing is, we live in two countries right now, a country with swing state markets, television markets, and the not. And, and Lucy and I were just in Boston, and you wouldn't think you'd be overwhelmed there, but you are because of New Hampshire. And, and so the, the, the diet of ads where you'd really want to divide it up, are you in a market with, with ads or not, or you know, swing state ads or, 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 or not. I mean, the thing is, I think that there's, I, I watched some focus groups where they had some people, these people were saying uh, they knew that he was a business guy, he seemed smart, he seemed like he was a successful business guy, and, and, they, and they know he's a Mormon. But the thing about it is even stipulating smart, successful business person, it doesn't say anything about whether he's trustworthy or not or whether he would handle the economy in a way that, that reflects values of, of normal people. And so the thing about it is I personally think that his campaign has made a horrific mistake in not flushing in, filling in, him, you know, who he is as a person so that people might be more willing to, I mean, even if they're willing to pull the trigger on President Obama, are they willing to say, okay, I'm going to go with you? Because, and I think their campaign's made a huge yeah. mistake. Uh, not on your side is rising in the swing states where people are getting that, uh, getting dosed by that uh, argument on Bain. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Ma'am in the back over there. Let's see, we're going to have our mic runners earn their pay today. Oh, it's coming from the, coming from the other side. Oh, I, it was actually Hi. her, but okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. Right. Hi, Nancy Zirkin. I don't um, ever read the uh, right-wing blogs or what's being said uh, about Romney. Um, he certainly fought hard using issues of, of the right Clock's in, ticking. Can we get in the question? primaries. So here, here uh, what, yeah. what are the blogs saying? 
Interesting point. Uh, kind of a the broad, conservative blog is about Romney? <laughs> yeah, and maybe be to use it to talk more broadly about the conservative uh, yeah. base in Romney. I mean, the conservative base has come home, as we should always expect the conservative or the liberal base will. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, Grover Norquist had, had my favorite line on this. All I want President Romney to do is sign the bills that Paul Ryan right. passes. Right, and that's their expectation. Can we just, yes, ma'am, you, yeah. When will the polls accurately tell us, or pretty accurately Ooh. tell us, when the, um, who's going to be president? What Ooh, good question. 1 a.m., 2 a.m., yeah. on the 7th? Yeah. They're, they're starting to be meaningful, though, right? Yeah. I mean, there, there is meaning. I mean, I, th I, think, I think most of us would say that at this point, the presidential approval rating with the race involving an incumbent president is probably the single best number to watch. Um, but, you know, I, I think it matters somewhat all the way through, and after the conventions, it, it obviously matters more. Uh, uh, sir, over here. Hold on. Matt, Mike is coming. Hold on. I wonder whether you would address the probability of things that the administration might do between now and the election that could move where we are right now. Similarly, things that the administration is not particularly looking forward to, like closing the Straits of Hormuz mm -hmm. or escalating that further, Israel attacks uh, Iran, um, particularly in the area of health care. Is it really necessary for him now to maintain the mandate, which is the most hated part of it all? He, Separate, the known unknowns, go ahead. He can't do anything domestically because the House won't pass anything, right? I mean, uh, so there's basically nothing they can do for the economy at this point, except maybe tiny stuff around the edges. I think foreign policy, which is what you suggested, is clearly the, the big thing. And I think that's why you see them managing the Iran situation the way they are managing it. First of all, they think the best policy is the way you avoid war, right? War, a war delayed is war avoided, right? But it also helps them politically because to the extent that you can keep the Israel-Iran tensions on a low boil, it keeps oil prices down. I think it's mostly the foreign policy before, stuff. Before Charlie right. jumps in, the other foreign policy, uh, what is your expectation? Does Europe reach a kind of crisis point between now and the election, or do they kind of muddle through? Uh, I think muddle through is the most likely scenario, but I think there is a significant chance of something much worse than muddle through, because there's a chance at some point the markets say, enough already, you guys aren't getting ahead of this, and, and it gets beyond their control. Charlie. You know, th this election, as of this moment, it's not about foreign policy. It's not even 1% about foreign policy. Now, obviously, you, you can't quantify the unquantifiable. If something happens, if there's a war, something like that, it will change things. We have no idea how it would change things. All we would know is all bets are off. And any kind of event that could do that, I think everybody in this room would be smart enough to know it when they saw it. Yeah. And so we just sort of have to assume that a black swan doesn't exist until we see it. And then we have to say, well, okay, everything's changed, now what? There may not be a bear in the woods, as Ronald Reagan said. Right. Okay. All right, we have time for one quick question. Let me go to the back, and then I'm going to ask a final question of the panelists. All okay, right, quick question. Um, it seems to me we've been framing this entire discussion around polls rather than on what either candidate may do to solve our problems. And we've seen the same thing from our elected officials. It seems to me it is, okay, by question. definition, impossible to lead if you're following polls. And the question is, is this a healthy way to have this discussion? Uh, well, I would say that we're here to discuss Campaign 360. And uh, we've been trying to give people a sense of what the dynamics are that are shaping the campaign. Uh, we've touched on and uh, the, the issue of the ability of either side to govern uh, after an election that is going to show us simultaneously two things, that the parties are deeply, deeply divided and the country is closely, closely divided. Deeply divided and closely divided uh, are, is a very challenging recipe for governance, especially with the added element that David noted uh, about before, which is the increased pressure, the increased kind of quasi-parliamentary nature of our politics, where each side faces increasing pressure to stand with their side against the other with an escalating series of sanctions when you don't culminating in primaries. So, I mean, that, that is kind of a summary of the situation that kind of overrides any individual issue, I think, you know. And, and again, if, if, if Republicans win unified control, they will attempt 
to do virtually all they're going to do in one reconciliation bill, which allows you to preclude uh, the Senate filibuster. It'll be interesting to see how much of that they can do. And if Obama doesn't, if Obama does win re-election, the choice really, I think, will fundamentally be the Republicans. Do they make the same calculation that the GOP Congress did in 97, which is that we're all going to have to live with each other for a while, let's make a deal, or do they face so much pressure that they just say, you know, we're going to try to wait you out again? So, I mean, it's a democracy. You can look, listen to polls too much, but most successful leaders in democracies spend a lot of time looking at public opinion. Roosevelt did, Reagan did. But I agree, you can go too far. Mm -hmm. All right, let me, ask, let me ask you guys a final question. I hope I can articulate it, uh, 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 it the right way. It's a close election, as we all anticipate it is now. Uh, it's somewhere close to 50-50. It is the last day before the election. It is the last night before the election. And Barack Obama and Mitt Romney are in their campaign planes, and they are you know, making these final decisions about where they're going. And each of them have decided they, they want to go to the one state that is the most likely to decide whether they win or they lose in a close election. Where do each of them go, David? Uh, Romney goes to Ohio. It's very difficult for Republicans to win without Ohio. And Obama goes to Virginia because it is the state that he can do the bank shot. And if he gets Virginia, he can potentially win without Ohio or Florida. I'd say exactly the same thing. Me too. Hey, Amazing. I, I feel like Amazing. I just passed. Amazing. <laughs> is, I, 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 absolutely. All exactly the same. I think the last place Barack Obama will be will be about 15 miles from, uh, from his house. Well, listen, thank you for, uh, for sticking with us. Thank you. Join me in thanking this terrific panel. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the festival and the rest of the election year.